Most people don't know that down at City Hall is one of the greatest cover-ups in Seattle's history. It's not a scandal, no corruption or smoking guns. It's a literal cover-up of a new City Hall being built just behind the municipal building, and it may be the city's best kept secret. Since the very beginning, Seattle has been looking for a proper place to call City Hall. A house for the people and a reflection of what this city stands for. After 150 years, the hunt may finally be over. Seattle is a city born out of the industrial age. The emphasis was on lumber, railroads, and commerce around a great port. But progress always seemed to be one step ahead of local government. City government was a bit of an afterthought. They didn't get around to a city government until 1865, and they immediately had a taxpayer revolt, and the legislature yanked the charter, and it operated out of a variety of sheds and boarding houses and stables and whatever they could, they could find. In 1882, Seattle saw the opening of its first city hall, a building that was shared with the police and fire departments. A modest house for an even smaller government, it held its own until 1889 and the day of Seattle's Great Fire. Even though Seattle's first city hall housed fire engine number one, it too went up in smoke. The Great Fire claimed most of the downtown core of Seattle. But the clouds of smoke did have a silver lining. It gave Seattle a chance to rebuild with more modern brick buildings. Unfortunately, the second city hall found itself in a clapboard contraption dubbed Katz and Jammer Hall. It was a recycled courthouse abandoned by the county and definitely not fireproof. Katz and Jammer Hall housed city government upstairs, the fire department on the main floor, and the jail in the basement. In time, conditions became so overcrowded and deplorable inside, the mayor said it was like being in jail. One noble citizen, Robert Fitzhenry, actually wrote the city and asked to be appointed to the official post of janitor of City Hall. Of course, at that time, cleaning up City Hall had more than one meaning. We had a pretty corrupt city government at the time. Katz and Jammer Hall became a place of endless additions and remodeling as the city expanded. If you've seen Rose Red, it was, it was sort of like that. It just kept on growing and sort of eating people along the way. Katz and Jammer Hall grew to become Katz and Jammer Castle, a bastardized building that most people in town loved to hate. The great rush to Alaska for gold put Seattle on the map as an up-and-coming city. In 1909, Seattle celebrated with the Alaska Yukon Exposition an extraordinary architectural display on the present site of the University of Washington campus. While the band played on and crowds flocked to the AYE, Seattle's third city hall was under construction. Extra floors were being tacked on to a new building on Yesler Street for the health and police departments. Despite protests from city planners, city hall was being wedged into a new home, again, an afterthought for local government. But the very next year, Seattle voters finally exercised great foresight and passed an initiative to create a true civic center, a plan to be conceived by civil engineer Virgil Bogue. Virgil Bogue rendered designs for a glorious government center. Stately Beaux-Arts buildings circled a spacious public gathering place. William Boeing could have landed his plane on the main promenade. Bogue had some marvelous ideas, by the way. He wanted to put a... a a light rail tunnel to Kirkland under Lake Washington and he wanted the city to buy Mercer Island as a park. But the Bogue plan was flawed. It put the Civic Center in the Denny Regrade area, away from the heart of downtown. And when it went to public vote, he forgot one critical piece of information. Nobody knew what it cost. In 1912, Seattle had its first chance to properly answer the needs of city government. And the answer was no. The Bogue plan sank faster than his tunnel to Kirkland. But voters did approve the construction of a new county courthouse. And in a familiar echoing refrain, city planners came up with a brilliant idea. Why don't we add a few more floors and create a space for City Hall? History did repeat itself, and the wheels of city government kept churning just as they always had. 
in spaces they could beg, borrow, or steal from other civic operations. And that's how it worked for the next 40 years. By the 1950s, Seattle was enjoying a new era of growth and optimism. The city had stars in its eyes and dreams of tomorrows all the way into the next century. While plans of a World's Fair were being drafted, the city of Seattle had dreams of its own, erecting the first public building in its history just for city hall government. You had a lot of ambition and optimism, but there was only so much money to go around. The city had a hole burning in its reserves, $7 million cash, which was to cover total construction. They put the new city hall on a fast-track lease purchase plan. Gordon Clinton, the mayor at the time, still keeps watch on his city from his home on Queen Anne. Dorm Brayman, who later became mayor after me, was the chairman of the finance committee. Fortunately, the city could pay for it in cash, which is a tribute, something that's pretty hard to come by in these days. The Butte Corporation from Dallas, Texas, won the construction contract with this design for a new municipal building. Rumor was that the plan actually was recycled from a previously built hospital, and that evoked cries of malpractice. Local architects were furious with the city, protesting its narrow-minded process. And when Seattle architect Victor Steinbrook saw the unimaginative design for what should be a great civic opportunity, he lashed out. He was uh, very critical of the design. He called it a, a Texas motel design that somebody got, you know, on the cheap. Victor Steinbrook wrote a scathing article on the building plan, picking it apart from top to bottom. He said, we should design civic architecture that, in a way that we can be proud and that can reflect our aspirations, our hopes for the future. But the die was cast, and City Hall's fate was sealed like the bid from Texas. Gordon Clinton broke ground on a building that seemed to be anything but groundbreaking. In 1962, Mayor Clinton had the honor of opening Century 21, a vision into the future that included a space needle, a monorail, and a civic plan that defined Seattle. A few months later, the municipal building opened. It was a quiet, understated affair, just like the building itself. The municipal building never has been accused of being great architecture, although in talking with Mayor Gordon Clinton, he says in 1962, when it was uh, opened, that there were people who called it cutting edge. Uh, that's hard to believe today. Well, it looked modern uh, in, a, in the sense of, I guess, a, a gas station or, some, or a mobile home of the period. Even Gordon Clinton felt the design was not perfect for a public house. I felt that the mayor's office should be on the first floor so that uh, it would have access by the people. But life on the 12th floor was never dull. Clinton had to handle the municipal building's first protest, a sit-in over black housing issues. Clinton got the best of the city's $7 million bargain when the building was new and the paint still fresh. But if you were an out-of-towner in 1962, you might have tried to get a room at City Hall. It did look like a hotel, the sort of place local citizens could gather to wait for the airport shuttle. This photo is from the Department of Licensing. With fresh cut flowers and a courteous staff, the caption here could read, and how many nights will you be spending with us, sir? But in time, just spending the day at City Hall began to wear on all the people who work there. Well, it was a dump. I mean, actually it was built on the cheap. The elevators didn't work. It, it looked like a Holiday Inn, if you could only put that big sign up. Even though some people say place matters, that place doesn't. <laughs> Uh, I joked uh, that the, the main benefit I had as becoming a new city council member was to have a free parking place downtown. This building is a, a dreadful example of what not to follow. I was quoted in the paper saying, the only good thing about working in City Hall is you don't have to look at City Hall. <laughs> when Charlie Royer said goodbye to Harriet Bullitt and King Television and hello to the mayor's office, it was like being cast in an episode of Home Improvement. There were stories all over about the about the leaks in the building and I don't mean political leaks I mean you know water actually coming from the roof garden George Benson had the corner office and uh, it was George's office where the brunt of the leaks happened and I had a squirt gun so I'd sneak down there and hide behind a uh, 
file cabinet in his outer office and then squirt him with the squirt gun. <laughs> and George would look up like this, you know, <laughs> to try to figure out what was going on. Royer did his share of entertaining celebrities and dignitaries during his three terms, and City Hall always presented a challenge. When Queen Elizabeth made a royal visit to Seattle, she was carefully steered far from the Muni Building and entertained at Seattle Center. You know, Winston Churchill said once that um, the way we shape our buildings is the way we shape our lives and the way we look at ourselves. And if we shape ourselves the way that building looked and look at ourselves the way that building looked, uh, we're in deep trouble. Well, I was a bit of a crank about criticizing the, the, uh, the municipal building. And as I say, I really feel now that the people who built it, you know, they didn't, spend, they didn't waste a lot of money. Bruce Chapman has been a Washington State Secretary, worked in the White House, and was a UN ambassador. But he had to start somewhere, and that was serving hard time as a council member in City Hall. The uh, cafeteria was really a hole in the wall, and it made you want, it did have the merit of making employees want to finish their lunches quickly and get back to work. Well, when we looked at the municipal building, we obviously could see that they hadn't spent a lot of money on art. To uh, have any art in there, you had to scrounge around and persuade the Seattle Art Museum to lend things, which they did. So at that time, we came up with the idea of 1% for art, which I think was one of the first municipal ordinances in the country to uh, have that requirement. Chapman now works for a forward-looking think tank in Seattle. To him, City Hall as a place was a major step backward. When I left the city council, some of my colleagues were kind enough and thoughtful enough to go to Victor Steinbrook. He had a, also a very strong dislike of bad architecture, as, as great as mine was for this building. And so they had him draw this building, and, uh, and then they all signed it. It really does look like a Holiday Inn. Well, the fondest memory, believe it or not, I have isn't actually about an issue, though. I remember uh, it was New Year's Day, I think it was. My son and I got the key and came down to City Hall and went into the mayor's office, and we looked at each other and said, you know, it's for real. They called him Mayor Nice, a name bestowed from the Seattle press. It was either Mayor Nice or Norman B. Rice. <laughs> either one or the other, that's what everybody does. But I think I'd rather be called Mayor Nice than a whole lot of other names. Rice was Seattle's first black mayor in an office he was determined to pursue in a city which was destined for change. You know, it's really kind of funny. For as much as that building is so depressing and, and ugly, there's life there, though. And I remember coming as a, a newly elected city council member in 78, and I found it to be uh, challenging, exhilarating. Uh, there's a pulse of its own. Although I remember the first day that I was uh, uh, coming to office as mayor, the elevator stuck. <laughs> the municipal building is a space that just never quite worked right. The exterior does have that 1960s Cold War feel. Maybe it was designed by the enemy. When Columbia Tower was built next door, Councilwoman Dolores Sabanga hoped it would fall on the Muni building so the city could collect the insurance and build a proper city hall. Most people don't know the rooftop garden of the municipal building is actually a public park. On a sunny day, it's a pleasant place to be. Close your eyes and the traffic sounds like the roar of the ocean, except for the frequent sirens. Inside, the heating and cooling systems use the same pipes, which means changing temperature is like turning a super tanker. Engineers have to watch the weather forecast to set comfort levels. A balmy winter day can turn the mayor's office into Palm Springs. And everyone seems to universally hate the elevators, which have hampered the pace of government for over 40 years. I mean, the elevators were horrible. I usually walked up and down the stairs. A small, unassuming lobby leading the way to cramped office spaces, the municipal building was not exactly the ideal gathering place for the community. Bad civic design did have its upside. It kept protesting down to a minimum. Maybe 69, Floyd Miller was, was acting mayor and several thousand people went down uh, Fourth Avenue and stopped in front of the building, blocked traffic, and, and Floyd came out on this little terrace, this third floor terrace, uh, to address uh, 
the, the masses, and everyone, they saw him and they started yelling, jump, jump. The municipal building's biggest weakness, however, is its weakness. Structurally, it has no place being in Seattle. I was walking in with the chief of police to meet the media the day after the Mardi Gras tragedy. And uh, at the precise moment we stepped through the threshold into the thing, we had the, the, the uh, earthquake, the 7.2 Nisqually earthquake. And um, suddenly it hit, it was, it was about noontime, and um, it was the most horrible, terrifying experience that one could imagine. I think we all thought we were, it was over. Floors were moving this big and plaster was falling and it was this huge noise. And I was thinking to myself, this is not how I want to go. I really don't want to be sandwiched between the mayor and the law department in this awful building. And I often thought after that, boy, I hope we get the new building done before we have the next earthquake. Most people are unaware that a new Civic Center for Seattle has been in planning since 1986, and it has employed the most comprehensive input process in the city's history. What should an ideal Civic Center be? I felt it had to be technology-centered, uh, it had to be environmentally responsible, it had to be transparent and open, it had to be a place we could point to with pride, it had to be a, a place that would only be Seattle. Open space. I think there's got to be a plaza or an openness so that uh, the force an outside civic ga gathering or a protest. It has to have both grandeur and a sense of, of uh, significance. This is the public's business that's going on here. Access is the, is the primary thing. It ought to express something about our aspirations, our values, and uh, physically what we, what we see as representing uh, the Northwest cultures. Seattle's major architectural projects are what attracted Peter Steinbrook to politics. An architect in his father's footsteps, he serves as the council lead on the new city hall. I knew that we, the city, was planning to do a new city hall, and I wanted to have a voice in that. In the final weeks of construction, the titanium dome rising above the council chamber signals a new home for city government. And when the dust finally settles, even the tallest building in Seattle has something to look up to. It's fabulous, wonderful. I actually didn't realize how bad the other building was until I found out how wonderful this was. Well, it's a matter of uh, comparing night and day. It's a great place, I think, to do the public's business. We've had an opportunity to try it out, and we've even had already had one or two protests here. There's room for everyone. This is, first and foremost, the people's place. It's a place where people would want to come and gather and participate with government. You know, we've never had that sort of a place in the current municipal building. Seattle's new city hall came from a team of designers led by principal architect Peter Bolin. Brad Tong is one of the senior project managers executing the plan. Peter Bolin as a lead designer has designed a timeless piece of architecture. His use of modern materials such as glass, steel, but combining those with ageless and timeless materials such as the French limestone and warm wood ceilings I think comes together really, really nicely as a modern but warm and comfortable place uh, to be. City Hall is now a gathering place on every level, from its gracious lobby right down to a cozy nook with a fireplace. The council chamber is a complete reversal of the old Muni building. This configuration actually works to bring the people in the audience closer to those of us who are behind the dais or at the conference table. And I think that in itself uh, gives a feeling of more intimacy and uh, uh, engagement in what is occurring here. Seattle Civic Center project is an evolving three block plan that turns tired old spaces into vibrant open public places with cascading views to Elliott Bay in the west. The Justice Center on Fifth Avenue is complete. The new city hall hides behind the current municipal building. The Muni Building and the Public Safety Building both will come down to make way for public plazas. The City Hall architect uh, worked in collaboration with the Justice Center architect across the street, employing the same uh, key materials, and uh, it really 
came together as a unified uh, civic campus. At $72 million, City Hall is a considerable investment. But the Civic Center project as a whole provides a long-term return on those dollars. The decision to build the two new buildings, City Hall and Justice Center, were based on a lot of analysis that was done. And we compared the cost of seismically upgrading those two buildings and um, restoring them to a, a, a prior level and it was more costly than building new buildings. So that translated into instructions to the architects to build a building that will last at least 100 years. We wanted an understated building that people would know was a civic building, both from the outside and from the inside. And I think that goal has been accomplished. The building is distinguished by its integration of art into the structure itself. Belize's brother is the artist in residence, finding a way to reflect the character of the city through her photo murals, which draw from over 7,000 images. You know, some of, the, some of your dreams are accomplished and some of them aren't, but you know, you try and bring as much as you can to the table. I think, you know, that's what's been so wonderful about the Seattle Arts Commission, a belief that it's really important to have artists at the table. This is a model of the wall that is in the lobby. This is the titanium uh, council chambers here. This is the, a glass wall that divides the um, public reception room and then the main lobby. These are just some of the images that we've been working with and just I have this belief that you know historical photos are not just sort of the old familiar ones but really the ones that, you know, show sort of a very hands-on, very much detail of something that was actually done by somebody's hands. Sort of unfamiliar images. This one, which is actually building of the Space Needle. And you really have to sort of look at it and then go, oh, of course that's what it is. Um, to people that are building the city in sort of a timeless manner, and then to more current images that really represent the voice of the people. Vancouver artist Eric Robertson created an installation that connects Seattle's original native heritage to when the city truly took wing. He was very much inspired by the notion there is an event called Paddle to Seattle and sort of represented the coming together of the various tribes in, in the region. What we should see here are actually four gunnels of canoes. So it's sort of something that might suggest the coming together is sort of a neutrality in this and the coming together of all the various tribes. And um, along these gunnels there are paddles that are sort of in, as if they were actually in motion that they've left here. These are actually hand carved by the artist. The paddles on the ends, there are two very large panels at the end and they're sort of like ceremonial paddles that represent um, sort of respect for the other tribe coming in, the, the idea of a raised paddle. And so you see the um, paddles, which in succession, they would actually represent the various raised paddles of all the canoers who have raised their paddles if you were to enter the sound. These raised panels then sort of form the ribs here of um, what look like airplane wings. And what the artist has done is taken the various influences of the Puget Sound region, um, in addition to the Native American, the tribal um, culture that's here, he sort of made reference to the airplane industry, the aerospace industry that really formed the economic backbone of this area during certain times. Bridging the council offices to the council chamber is James Carpenter's Blue Glass Passage, a floating glass walkway that he describes as a transposed slice of water. And even the rooftop is a work of art. A newly planted garden provides visual relief with an added benefit. The rooftop actually provides a means to filter and absorb the water that is collected on the roof, rather than putting it into a storm drain where it then has to go to a treatment plant and be filtered before it's released back into uh, the hydrological cycle. Uh, we're doing a more uh, environmentally friendly approach and produces something beautiful and green for people to look at. Uh, this project represents um, about the most significant uh, public or private project that I've worked on. The 
thoughtful master plan that was developed over many, many years to do an extraordinary civic emblematic piece uh, for this city, uh, which I love and live in, is uh, just extraordinary. So the opportunity has just been phenomenal. Well, we'd like to get started. This is an important day in many respects. We're happy that all of you are here to help join in the celebration of the opening of the new People's City Hall. On August 1, 2003, Council Members Peter Steinbrook and Jan Drago usher in a new era for Seattle City Hall. Okay, are we ready? One, two, three, here we go! The baton literally could be passed between the two buildings, standing for the moment at arm's length apart. But at 604th Avenue, the lights are off and the office is silent as the old Muni building awaits its fate. Windows are propped open for one last gasp of air. Rumors are circulating that the council is going to sell chances to whack the building with a sledgehammer, a demise Gordon Clinton never could have foreseen 40 years ago. And if the city wanted to generate a little more revenue, maybe it could sell the new city hall plans to a company in Texas. Well, I would hope that uh, our citizens and residents in Seattle would feel that this is their building, and I would encourage them to come see it, experience it, come to a council meeting, participate in the democratic process, and, and get engaged in politics, because that's what this building is really for. It's for the people of Seattle. We will not be building another city hall in any of our lifetimes, and I guarantee you that. The decisions that are made in this building can be very important and can, can generate huge headlines, or they can be issues that are important to, for the particular people involved, even if the rest of us never hear about it. In either case, they need to be dealt with respectfully, and I think this building gives it that kind of uh, sense of, uh, of importance. After 150 years, Seattle's search for a proper city hall has come to a close. In the beginning, progress always was one step ahead of city government. Now the city's government center is the very definition of progress.